Alright everyone, welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James over here with you. We are coming to you live. Again, this is a live call-in program. If you have a Bible question, we'll be glad to take your calls and your comments and have a Bible discussion with you. I want to go ahead and give you some contact information so that you can know how to reach us. Uh, 276-340-2653 is my regular number. If you want to call on the, line, on the air, that number is area code 336-426. Uh, 427-9696, that's 427-9696, or 627-9563, 627-9563, 6 is the area code for both of those numbers, 336-427-9696, or 627-9563, uh, words from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email, and we're going to be discussing a, uh, a letter, a comment, or that was written to me. And so that's one way that you can have a Bible discussion with us. You may not want to call on the air. We wish you would. But if you don't want to, you want to contact me by email or text or carrier pigeon, however you want to do it. Uh, we'll be glad to discuss your Bible uh, questions or comments. And uh, let's just see if we can have some unity on what the Bible is saying. Jesus said we could have unity in John 70 and 17. And that's really what we're all about, friends. Uh, this is brought to you by the Church of Christ that meets at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And we meet at 9 a.m. for Bible study on Sundays and 10 a.m. for worship. And then we have Bible study at 7 p.m. on Thursday nights if you would like to join us there. And so this is how you can uh, take advantage of, of the opportunities that we have to study, study the Bible with you. If you are uh, looking for a group of people that are interested in studying the Bible, this is the place you need to be at the Church of Christ. And so we're always willing to do that very thing. You can you can have a Bible study with us. Uh, just let us know that you are interested and we'll get information out to you. If you'd like a free book, we have all of our literature is free. We have DVDs, we have printed literature, we have books that, that will be beneficial for your study. And so we hope that you will take advantage of, very, of that very thing. So give us a call and uh, we'll be glad to excuse me, have a Bible study with you. Uh, again, that uh, online, that live number, before we get into our lesson today, that live number is area code 336-427-9696. That's 427-WMYN or 627-9563, 627-WLOE. Now, let's just go and get into uh, our lesson tonight. This is, this is going to be uh, based upon a a letter that someone uh, sent to me as an email, and uh, this is what the, the writer says. It says, what confuses me is the scriptures that seem to suggest that being saved is eternal and can't be lost. A few of them are Ephesians 4, 29, Ephesians 1, 12, and Romans 8, 37, Philippians 1, 6. The writer goes on to say, It almost seems wrong to suggest that Christ has the power to save, but not to keep one saved. It seems that this would mean that we possess more power than Christ. Please provide me scriptures where someone lost their salvation. <clears throat> okay, friends, now this is a good question. And uh, uh, last week we had a, a caller called in had a good question about giving, and so... You know, there's all kinds of topics that we can be discussing. So, really, we're talking about uh, uh, eternal security. Does the Bible teach that one once saved, always saved is really what we're dealing with? Now, you may not have heard uh, these verses before, but I can assure you that if you're in the Baptist church or in pretty much any denomination out there today, that you are have been taught once saved, always saved. That you've been taught that you can't fall from grace, that you... Uh, or once you once you have been saved, or we got saved, as many people say, then you just can't lose your salvation. But listen to what a this is a Baptist preacher. I'm gonna play this this clip from this Baptist preacher. Listen to what he says. This is Mr. Randy Linderman, and uh, at the time he was preaching for the Druid Hills Baptist Church in Martinsville, and I can't remember what what church he's with now. But he and I had uh, an on air discussion on television, and so that just shows that you can get your pastor, bishop, rabbi, or whatever to come on, and we'll be glad to discuss with them too. I mean, I have a chair sitting right across from me. If you, if your preacher, your pastor, bishop, whoever it is, elder, uh, wants to come on and have a Bible discussion, we can 
arrange that very thing. I mean, it should be so simple. It won't cost you anything. It just costs your, your preacher the willingness to come on, which I'm going to tell you, friends, there's not many preachers in this area that will because they, they realize that what they're teaching is not in the Bible. Now, you may not realize that they realize that, but they know it, and that's why they won't come on and have a Bible discussion. But you and I can, and I can assure you that what is going to be said is going to be right from the Bible. You will definitely get a word from the Lord. But listen to what this Baptist preacher says, having to deal with uh, eternal security, and he's going to be talking about uh, being sealed unto the day of redemption. And that's really where the, the springboard is going to be for this uh, lesson uh, this evening. So here's what he has to say. This is Randy Linderman from the Druid Hills uh, Baptist Church. It would just simply be the church. But what about people like myself that believes that when you take a, a signet ring and you put a seal on it, and the Bible says you're sealed to the day of redemption once you accept Jesus Christ, then I know that if I were to come over to the Church of Christ and you don't believe in eternal security, then I don't have the same fellowship as you. Okay. I believe that the Bible teaches in eternal security. All right, so the Bible, he believes the Bible teaches in teaches eternal security. And just a little side note there, <clears throat> friend, did you notice that he said that that the Baptist church is not in fellowship with the church of Christ? And that's fine for him to say that. I would agree with that. And it's because we believe different things. Now, friends, the problem is not believe it, the problem is not in believing in different things. The problem is not being willing to sit down and trying to have unity on those differences because if the Bible's right, somebody has to be wrong. We both may be wrong, but one thing is for sure: the Bible is not wrong. And so, we uh, we can we can uh, come to an understanding about what God wants for us to do. So he's he's saying that the Baptist Church and the Church of Christ is not in fellowship, and one of the reasons why is because they believe that you cannot lose your salvation. Eternal security is what he believes the Bible teaches. Well, friends. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Let's go back to the, some verses that were used in the letter. And again, one that Mr. Lindemann uh, referenced. In Ephesians 4 and verse 29, and I encourage you, friends, if you're sitting there listening, you're in your living room, you're sitting on the couch, maybe you're in the front porch, maybe you're in your car. Uh, pull over if you're in the car, but get your Bibles out, get your pen and paper out, and jot down these verses, and let's just go through and study them together. Because, again, I promise you, that if you look at these verses in the context of the of the Bible, the whole Bible, then you will only come to one conclusion, and that is that the Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. So let's look at these verses. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that is which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Ghost of God, Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, if you're just reading that and you have a preconceived idea that this is what the Bible's teaching, then you're going to say, well, there it is. Once saved, always saved. But we have to look and see, well, does that agree with other things that are written in the Bible? In Ephesians 1, verse 13, consider this verse. In whom also ye trusted, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now there's two verses right there, both from the book of Ephesians, that someone's saying, well, James, you're not helping your case because you're saying that individuals uh, do not have eternal security, and these verses sure seem to sound like you're sealed by the Spirit and therefore you cannot fall. Well, it may seem that way, but remember, remember the language that the uh, the the person who wrote the letter and the questions uh, used, they said, you know what? It seems to say, it appears to say, uh, well, just because something appears or seems or, or whatever, that doesn't mean that that is what the, what the verse is saying. You have to look at the entire context of the Bible. Remember who is being uh, written to. Who You're reading someone else's mail, so we have to put that in context as well. So you need to consider what the verses say, but also consider what they do not say. Now, it does not say that you cannot lose your salvation. It just says you're sealed. So we have to find out what does that mean? The Holy Spirit, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Because if it means 
uh, something other than you cannot lose your salvation, then that once saved, always saved doctrine is, has to go out the window. So we have to find out what does it say. And what is even more important is think about what is meant, not what is seemingly suggested, as the, as the writer says. So, you know, friends, it, there's a very dangerous thing in taking a verse and saying, well, the Bible says you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, therefore, once saved, always saved. Friends, that's a pretty big jump. That's a pretty big jump. You're actually putting a definition on the word sealed by the Holy Spirit, and you're, you're putting a definition of once saved, always saved on it, which, you know, may or may not be the case. And I think when we show it, when we show you what the rest of the Bible is saying, that it definitely is, is going to be proven that it is not the case of once saved, always saved. So instead of asking, you know, well, doesn't it seem to say this or suggest this? Just say, well, let's get another word from the Lord on it. Let's get some more words and let's see if that's what the Bible is saying. Now, you may have some thoughts on this and you may have some questions about this so far. So if you would like to to call in, we'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, area code 336-427-9696 or 627 that's 427-9696 or 627-9563. Now, so here's the question. What does the Bible mean when it says we are sealed? That's the big question. What does the Bible mean when it says we are sealed? Well, let's start off with the definition of the word seal. Uh, if someone says, well, that seal means that you're preserved or you're uh, kept you know, just like you would you seal a, a can of green beans or something, and that means that uh, you, you never can fall. Well, that's not what the word actually means. Here's what the word means. This word seal, and if you have a strong concordance, I really encourage you to get a strong concordance if you want to to study words. A, word, a good word study is a, is a very, very valuable tool. Uh, it's a very good thing to, to use in, in your Bible study. But listen what the word seal means. Now, if you have your Strong's Concordance, that's Strong's number 4973. But here's the definition. One, a seal placed up on books. Number two, a signet ring. Number three, the inscription or impression made by a seal. Number four, that by which anything is confirmed proved, authenticated as by a seal that is a token or proof. So there's really no no place in that definition if you're sealed by the Holy Spirit to say, well, once saved, always saved. I mean, that, that definition, there's not even a 40-second cousin to that definition in, in what this word means. So this word is indicating that it's something that is confirmed or proved or authenticated as by a seal. Now, this word is used 41 times in the New Testament. Uh, 31 times, it's in revelation alone, a revelation alone. So you know that this is going to uh, be something that is uh, uh, special. It's not just a once saved, always saved definition. It's going to be something that has a, a, a connotation to it, like something that is visible, something easily seen. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, if we're sealed... If we are sealed by the Spirit, then it must be something visible in some way, right? When Paul said you are sealed by the Spirit, there had to be some kind of visible seal, something that could be seen, some way, shape, or form in which these people were sealed by the Spirit, not once saved, always saved, not some warm feeling in your heart. It has to be uh, something along these lines, something that is, is, is clearly visible now. I want you to consider, I want you to consider another verse here. In Romans 4 and verse 11, listen to what, listen how the word is used. Uh, Romans 4 and verse 11, now in the context, let's get a little context here. In the context, we're talking about Abraham and the, uh, the, the sign or the seal that was given him. Now let's start in verse 10. Romans 4 and verse 10. If you have your Bibles, read along with me. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? That is, how was uh, Abraham reckoned, how was uh, Abraham uh, accounted for righteousness? How was his righteousness reckoned? Was it when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? 
not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Now listen, here's verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that, uh, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Now, that word seal is used there in Romans 4 verse 11. And it's talking about circumcision. The sign of circumcision was the seal that Abraham had faith, the seal of his righteousness. Now, friends, I'm going to tell you, seal, when, uh, if circumcision is a seal, that's something more than just this, uh, a feeling of once saved, always saved. That is something that is, you know, it's visible. And I'm sure that uh, when uh, uh, the Jews and all the, the, the children of Israel were circumcised, they didn't just think it was something like once saved, always saved. That was, that was a token. It was something that was clearly seen, something that was confirmed, something that was proved, authenticated that they were part of this covenant that God had just made with Abraham. Now, if you don't think that's important, then you just try being a Jew, a male Jew that was not circumcised. You would be cut off from Israel. You were not allowed to be part of the covenant. You were not part of the uh, children of Israel because you were not part of the covenant. And the uh, circumcision was the sign of that covenant. So when we're talking about being sealed by the Spirit, we're talking about something that's uh, more than just a, well, I think I'm, I'm saved, once saved, always saved. Now let's see how this word sealed is used in other places in the Bible. Because remember, we're talking about individuals that say, well, we're sealed by the Spirit, therefore once saved, always saved. Well, again, let's see what the Word says. In John 6 and verse 27, John 6 and verse 27, Jesus uses the same word. Listen to what he says. He says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So Christ says that uh, he was sealed by the Father. Now remember, the seal is that is something that is confirmed or proved or uh, an authenticated. All right, we got a phone call, so we're going to go to. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm not getting it through here. Um, here we go. Hello, Shane. Hey, how are you doing? All right, how are you? I'm doing great. I, I want to ask you something. All right. Do you go to Tesla Home, talk particularly in Nelson Home? And the. Teach in the nursing home? I said, do you go to the nursing home and talk to people in the nursing home? I do, sometimes. Or do you ask them uh, to say? If I'm, teach if I'm able to teach a Bible lesson, I, I definitely cover that. Yes, All I right. do. Uh, if we, we want to die, where do we go? Can you be able be baptized? Will it still go to heaven? If someone in the nursing home dies and has not been baptized, will they go to heaven? Is that your question? I said, they ain't able to be baptized. Someone ain't able to get in, no spoon to get baptized, you know. Okay. And someone that can't walk, and where they pass away and go to heaven. All right. Well, let me ask you this. I'll, I'll answer your question with a question. What if they... What if they die before they confess that they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are they going to be in heaven? I said, well, they ain't, ain't going to be baptized. I, I'm asking you a question, though. I'm asking you a question. Yeah. What, what, if, what if they die before they confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because Jesus said, if you confess not that I'm He, you'll die in your sins. Or if you believe not that I'm He, you'll die in your sins. But you have to confess... His name before men. Now, what if they die before they make the confession of their belief in Christ? Are they going to be saved? Well, uh, they ain't able to get baptized. They still go ahead. Even if they don't confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They ain't uh, baptized. I, I'm not talking about they baptism. I'm talking about, I'm talking about confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What if they die before they do that? 
How do you, no, I'm talking about they haven't even confessed Jesus is the Son of God. What if they don't even believe that He's the Son of God? How do you know they don't believe in God? What if they say they're an atheist? And then they die. Now what are they going to do? Well, James, I'll tell you, buddy. Here's why I'm asking. You're saying, what if they can't be baptized? And I'm saying they have just as much opportunity to be baptized as they do to, to uh, make a I confession. Ma no, 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 wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. No, listen. No, listen. They have just as much opportunity to hear the gospel and be obedient to it in their situation now as they do, uh, you know, uh, as, I mean, in the previous life, they've had a chance to hear the gospel, repent, believe, with, believe, repent of their sins, confess Christ, and be baptized. Now, just because they're not baptized, you're saying, well, they're going to be saved. And I'm saying, what if they don't make the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe... Do you believe Romans 10, verse 9, yep. if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus? Yep. Now, what if they don't confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus? Be do, do you think they'll be saved if they do not confess? Now, I know what you're talking about, but answer my question. If someone does not confess Jesus with their mouth, are they going to be saved? You gotta talk. Well, hmm? I don't know now. I don't well, know. well, the Bible says. The Bible says. Well, the Bible says if they don't confess, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou and believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. Now, answer my question. Well, you can you can confess Christ without having a voice. I mean, people talk in sign language. Sign language is a language. So if I ask someone, do you believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, and they said yes, they nodded their head, that would be an answer. But what if they didn't do that? See, here's, here's, here's the problem we're having, my friend, is this. You want to draw the line at baptism. They can't get in the water, therefore God's still going to save them. But I'm saying, what if they don't make that confession? Is God still going to save them? You're drawing the line at baptism, and I'm saying... Uh, I'm drawing a line to baptism. You're saying, well, if they if they do this before baptism, they're all right. Now, why is it it's okay to disobey God and not be baptized, but it's not okay to disobey God and not confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Well, baptized ain't gonna take your head nowhere. Well, what if what if I read this verse to you? First Peter three in verse twenty one. Have you read this verse? 1 Peter 3, in verse 21. I want you to get your Bible, and I want you to read this, and listen to what Peter says. Peter says, the like figure, let's look verse 20. Verse 20, he's talking about Noah being saved, and he says, uh, in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein a few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Then he says, the like figure, wherein to even baptism, doth also now save us. So does baptism save us or not? No, God saves Baptized ain't got enough to do with it. Peter says baptism doth also now save us. Are you are you arguing with Peter? I know, no, but I didn't tell you what, what the uh, you, God says. You, you're not says telling me what the Bible says. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a word from the Lord. I'm giving you a word from the Lord and you're giving me a word from from some man. Peter said, Baptism doth also now save us. 1 Peter 3.21. Go read it. Now you tell me, if Peter says, Baptism doth also now save us, does it save us? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> you're not arguing with me, my friend. You're arguing, with the, you're arguing with the Bible. Peter says, Baptism saves us. And you, and you won't agree with Peter. Are you going to disagree with him or agree with him? Well, Peter says baptism saves us. Now, all right, so you're arguing with Peter again. You're arguing with Peter, right? I'm, I'm reading the King James Bible. I've got it right in front of me. 
<laughs> Everyone I read says the same thing. Why don't you get you another one? A King James, uh, King James 3. I'm, I've got a King James Bible. I've got one in front of me on my computer, and i got one of them in front of me on my desk that I'm, that I'm reading out of. Now, you're arguing with Peter again, aren't you? You're arguing with Peter. Will you argue with Jesus? Let's... All right, now listen. All right, now listen. Let me, let me read you one more verse. Jesus says in Mark 16, 16, and I had a lady read this on TV uh, Thursday night. She read it, and she came to the right conclusion. I'm going to see if you will come to the right conclusion. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, where is salvation is it before baptism or is it after baptism is that all you have to do is confess with your mouth yep that's all do you have to repent All right, I'm reading that. I'm going to read that again. Let's go back to Romans. Now, folks, if you're at home and you're sitting on your couch and you're following along with us, Romans 10, verse 9 is where we're going. Now, let's read this together. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Uh, I, I, we've talked. Well, I've talked to you before. What, what's your name? Jimmy. Jimmy. Okay. Oh, Jimmy. I, uh, tell you that. I, I know. All right. I, I just want to get a name so we can talk like like we're friends. Right. All right. So Jimmy, now, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe with thine heart, now tell me something. Did you hear anything about repent in that verse? You don't want to say it? You want me to read it again? No, you don't want to read it. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now. Oh, James. Oh, oh. said you faith in your mouth. What? I'll save you. All right, but I'm saying. Oh, you're <laughs> But now listen. Now listen, Jimmy. This is what we're talking about here. I'm asking you, did he say anything about repent? I'm not arguing. We're not arguing. Yeah, I just, I don't, I don't <clears throat> I, all right, you're not arguing with me. I'm saying just, I just ask you if you heard me, if you heard anything in that verse about repent. Well, the answer is no. You can read it, you can read it for yourself, but there's nothing in that verse about repent. Now, here's, here's my question, Jimmy. Nothing in that verse about repentance. So, does a person have to repent in order to be saved? Do you, so you don't have to repent? Repent of your sins. Yeah, repent of your sins. But that's not repenting. That's not repenting. Re repenting, confession is not repenting. Confession of Christ is one thing. Repenting of your sins is something else. I mean, there's a lot of people that say they believe in Jesus. But that doesn't mean they repent. Would you agree with that? No, uh, no, 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 no. We're staying right here. No, no, no. We're staying right here. I'm asking you, can a person be saved if they confess Jesus, but they don't repent of their sins? Uh, all right. All right, Jimmy, I'm going to let you go because you're not, we're not, we're not, you're not playing fair. Here's my, here's my, here's my, here, Here's my, here's my point. Here's my point. That verse says nothing about repentance. And you say, well, it doesn't say anything about baptism. Therefore, baptism's out. Well, it doesn't say anything about repentance. Is repentance out? Well, that's how it is. You're going to take your head, and I know that. Well, I know, I know this. The Bible says a person must confess. They must believe with their heart. They must confess with their mouth. They must repent, Acts 17 to verse 30. Acts 17, verse 30. They must repent 
God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now that verse doesn't say anything about repent, but yet you know and I know that a person has to repent. So just because something's not in one particular verse, does that mean that we don't have to do it? I, I'm 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 in the Lord's church, and what church are you in? Pleasant View Baptist. Yes, sir. Now, I, the one now, what's your preacher's name over there? We got a new preacher. Right. We got a new preacher. I, I know. What's his name? I can't find his name on that. I mean, he ain't really tell the truth. I, I bet I bet he won't tell the truth about baptism for the remission of sins. Ask him if you've got to repent. I, I, bet, I bet if you ask him if you have to repent, I bet he'll say yes. Oh, I don't ask him Sunday. Ask him if you've got to repent and ask him if you have to be baptized for the remission of sins. He'll say you will have to repent, but you won't. You don't have to be baptized for the remission of sins. And the Bible says you've got to do both. Right. Are you asking me? Call, ask him and call back next week, okay? Oh, I'll, I'll think about it. No, don't think about it. Hey, let's get together and study sometime. <laughs> We're right there in Eden together. Well, I don't want to wait till Sunday. Let's get together sometime this week. I won't be busy this week. Okay. All right. We'll call back next Sunday then. I'll, I'll think about it. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks for thanks for listening. Uh -huh. All right. All right, friends. Old Jimmy from Pleasant View Baptist Church in Eden. Now, now, friends, I that was a good call. I, I'm glad to talk to Jimmy. Uh, he's not being honest with himself. I think he hears the truth. He he hears what I'm saying. He's just having a tough time admitting it. But that's all right because a lot of people have that trouble. But friends, we're just we're just putting out the Bible, putting out the word here. And you know, if you're gonna if somebody's gonna argue with it, <clears throat> they're just going to argue with the Bible. <clears throat> now we kind of got off track there. That's fine. That was a good discussion. But friends, you have to know this: just because something is said in one verse, that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that God says on the matter. Now let me give you let me give you something to think about along those lines. For example, a lot of people want to go to John, the book of John, to talk about salvation. And they're talking about how well John three sixteen or whatever. Believe, believe, believe. But friends, you know the word repent is not even in the book of John. It's not even in the book of John. So if you just read the book of John, you'll never hear that you have to repent. But you and I both know we have to repent. We all know we have to repent. So how do we how do we come to the conclusion that we have to repent? Well, we go to another verse. There's something else written. It is written again. And so that's how we're dealing with this. Let's find out where it's written again. And that sheds more light on the subject. Okay? All right. Thanks for the call, Jimmy. Now, let's get back to sealed by the Spirit. Now, Jesus said that God had sealed him, John six twenty seven. We read that. Now, if you want to call in, let me say this. If you want to call in, pick up where Jimmy left off. That's fine. Phone number is 336. That's area code, 336-427-9696. That's 427-9696. Or 627-9563. That's 627-WLOE. All right. Now, so how was it that God sealed the Son? Well, let's find another verse in John 1, verse 16. Let's start reading in John chapter 1. Get your Bibles out. John chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 26. John 1, 26. John, this is John the baptizer. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Arba, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore uh, I am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. And I knew him not, but that he that sent me to baptize with water, and that's the Father, 
The same said unto me. So this is what God told John the baptizer. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, how did John know? What was the, the seal? What was the signifying thing that showed John that Jesus was the Son of God? Well, the Holy Spirit descending upon him and remaining upon him. And that's how John knew. See, it was something visible. Now listen, in Acts 10 and verse 38, here's this word again. Acts 10 verse 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now think about that. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. That, that was a outward sign, if you will, to use some uh, pretty familiar vernacular. Now, listen, if Jesus, if Jesus had to be sealed with a visible sign in order for John to know who he is, then that is, that is a different kind of seal, or that's, that's different than what our denominational friends say about once saved, always saved. All right? Where's the seal of your once saved, always saved? Well, they, well, there's no seal there. But a seal is something outward. It's visible. Something seen. Uh, now, Jesus said in Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So, how was Jesus uh, sealed he was doing things, miraculous things, by the power of the Holy Spirit that verified that he was the Son of God. See that? The Spirit came upon him and remained. That was something that John saw. That was a, a visible uh, uh, signifying uh, element that this was the Son of God. And then Jesus went about uh, healing, the, uh, healing the brokenhearted, the recovering the sight to the blind, setting at liberty them that are bruised. He's, he's doing miracles while he's preaching, and thus it's more indication that he indeed is the Son of God that John was looking for. Now, in Acts 2, verse 22, we find another statement about Christ and about God's approval of him. In Acts 2, 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Now, how did people know that Jesus was the Son of God? The things that he did, the miracles that he did, those uh, clearly visible tokens, if you will, of, of his uh, authentication that he was indeed the Son of God. The miracles that he did confirmed or proved or authenticated that he was the Son of God. Now, friends, that's his seal. See, a seal is, is, is outward. It is something that is, that is seen. Now, I, I want you to think about this. When uh, John 7, 31, when the people were talking about Jesus, listen to what they said. Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, Will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? They recognized that what he was doing was a sign or a token or an authentication that he was indeed the Christ. So you're sealed by miracles that were done. That's a visible seal. They were his proof, if you will. Uh, remember Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night? What did he say? In John 3 and verse 2, John chapter 3 and verse 2, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So the approval or the seal that God gave Jesus was the works that he did. In John 5, 36, that's exactly what Jesus said. Are you writing this down? Am I going too fast for you? John 5 and verse 36, listen to what Jesus says. He says, I have greater witness than that of John, 
the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So the miracles that, that Jesus was doing was a visible sign, a clear indication, an, an authentication or uh, authenticating fact that he was the Son of God. Now, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about being sealed. Being sealed. Now, let's look at one more. Let's look at how the apostles were sealed. Now, the reason I'm saying this, friends, you say, well, James, this sounds like a lesson on the Holy Spirit, not on once saved, always saved. Well, maybe it is. It's a, it's a lesson that shows you that when the Bible talks about being sealed by the Spirit, it's not talking about once saved, always saved. It's actually talking about miraculous gifts that were used to confirm or verify to prove that someone was who they said they were. Now, let's look at, at 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. Now, here's Paul. Paul's writing, and here's what he says. He says, Now, he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given, a, given the earnest of the spirits in our hearts. Now, how did God seal the apostles? How did he seal them? What was the, what was the stamp of approval that he put upon them? Now remember, remember apostles were ambassadors for, for God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, uh, Paul says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. They're ambassadors. Friends, ambassadors have authority. They have a power to make rules or make decisions, and that's what the apostles were. When you hear somebody today say, well, we're all ambassadors for Christ. No, we're not ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador has a power and authority that we don't have. The, no apostles living on earth today. But Paul, as an apostle, had a seal. He'd been sealed. He had been given power. He had been given proof that he indeed was an apostle of God. Listen, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 2, Paul said, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Now, what was Paul's seal of apostleship? What, what possibly could make him be set, up, set apart from anybody else that comes along and says, Well, I'm an apostle. Well, here's the difference. An apostle had abilities that no one else had because they had been sealed by the Spirit. Now, what were those abilities? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Paul says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So an apostle was doing things that no one else could do, and that included the ability to lay hands on individuals and impart miraculous gifts to them. You see, this is what it means to be sealed by the Spirit. You're a a actually doing things, able to do things that no one else could do. That's what it means to be sealed by the Spirit. And if Paul or another apostle came along and laid hands on someone, they could impart miraculous gifts. That's exactly what you have in Acts 8 and verse 13. Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, this is, this is Acts 8, and I'm in verse 14. Sorry. Going a little too fast for you. Acts 8, verse 14, in case you're writing this down. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto, Peter, unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Friends, one of the tokens or the signs or the seal of an apostleship, of an apostle was he could impart miraculous gifts. No one else could do that. 
And that's what I'm saying. When someone was sealed by the Spirit, they were doing things that no one else could do. It was visible. It was apparent. It was clear. These people are doing things that they could only do if God was with them. Now, I'm hoping this helps you understand what the Bible is saying then when you get to uh, Ephesians and you hear Paul say you're sealed by the Spirit. It's not a keeping you until eternal security. That's not what that means. What it means is you've been given the, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Look, in Romans 1 verse 11, let's get one more here. Romans 1 verse 11. By the way, if you got a copy of my notes on this, you want, you want all these verses, I'll, I'll give you a copy of, of uh, a printed out copy uh, of all these scriptures. Uh, or I'll give you a copy of this program. You can listen to it uh, again. Uh, however it will help you, I'll be glad to do that for you. But Romans 1 and verse 11. Uh, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. Paul wanted to give them a miraculous gift, a spiritual gift. Now, he could do that because he was an apostle and he had been sealed by the Spirit. That was his seal of apostleship. That was his token of apostleship. All right, now, you may have some questions. You may have some comments that you want to give there. So I'm going to give your phone numbers out again. Area code 336 427 9696. That's 427 9696 or 627 9563. 627 9563. Okay, so if Paul could give these miraculous gifts, the fact that he could do that was his seal of apostleship. That was his seal of God. Then what does that mean then when you get to Ephesians 1 and verse 13? And then you hear Paul say to the Ephesians, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye had, had heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye, that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, if they were obedient to the gospel and they believed, it wasn't some... Uh, I don't know, some mystical element that preserves them for eternity. But after they had believed, that is after they obeyed the gospel, they were actually given uh, miraculous gifts. Now, how do I know that? Because look at Acts 19. See, friends, this is one thing that you have to do. When you're reading letters like Ephesians and Corinthians and, and Galatians and Philippians and Thessalonians, you need to realize that all of these churches had their beginning in the book of Acts. And so you need to realize that when you're reading these books, these letters, you're reading somebody else's mail. You're reading letters that were written to people that had already obeyed the gospel. So the thing to do when you're reading Ephesians 1.13 and you read that Paul had sealed them with the Holy Spirit or they had been sealed with the Holy Spirit, Maybe you should go back to Acts chapter 19 and find out what happened when the Ephesians believed. In Acts 19, the Bible says it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what's the next verse say? Right to this point, what we have is we have them believing and now being baptized, just like the Great Commission, said, Great Commission said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. This is where we have the Ephesians. They have heard, they have believed, and they have been baptized for the remission of sins. Now, look what happens. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So the seal that they had been given was through the laying on of the Apostle Paul's hands. 
That was the that was the seal. The visible seal was them being able to do miracles. Those them uh, speaking in tongues and prophesying. That could only have happened if an apostle who had been sealed by the Spirit laid hands on them and imparted these spiritual mirac or miraculous gifts. That that's what we're dealing with. See this? See how easy it is when the Bible, when you put the Bible together the way it's supposed to, when you see, when you put verse uh, with verse, let the Bible be its own best commentary, and you let the Bible explain verses, friends, it's so, so clear. Ephesians 1 thir verse 13, when Paul said you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, he wasn't saying, he wasn't saying, well, yeah, you've, you, you, you once saved, always saved. No, he was talking about miraculous gifts that he had imparted unto them through the laying on of his hands. Now, that that's what we're dealing with. See? So when someone says, once saved, always saved, it just shows that they're coming to this verse with a preconceived idea about what it means. They're coming with a preconceived idea about, well, here's a man-made doctrine that we have to support, so let's find a verse that sounds like that. Let's find a verse that sounds something like what I believe, and let's go with that. Friends, that's not what that verse teaches. And a little, just a simple, basic Bible study helps show that. Now, it didn't, it won't take wouldn't take long for you to do a word study and, and and look at the word seal, and you would come up to the same conclusion. It doesn't fit the definition of once saved, always saved. But it will fit the definition of miracles being done to confirm a message or miracles being done to confirm a messenger was speaking for God or miracles that were imparted upon believers in order to establish them in the faith. So you have to realize the, the, the purpose of miracles too. In the first century, the New Testament had not been written. They were in the process of writing it. So <clears throat> they didn't have the, the, the book of, of Romans. That's why Paul said, and we read this earlier, in Romans 1 verse 11, Romans 1 verse 11, he said, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. Well, why would they need to be established? Because they didn't have all the word. They didn't have all of the, the writings. They didn't have all the, uh, the revealed a will of God that could uh, build them up and edify them. Now, the word of grace is what edifies people. Acts 20, verse 32. When Paul left, he said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance uh, among all them that are sanctified. That's Acts 20, verse 32. But they didn't have all that was written at, at, at certain points in time. So, they needed miraculous gifts. They needed these gifts of prophecy and gifts of wisdom and discerning of spirits and ways, uh, gifts of interpretation and gifts of tongues that they could use to reveal God's will. See that? Miracles were always used to confirm the word. And in this case, it was used to confirm messengers that the people were speaking for God or on God's behalf. And so that's the seal. That's the, that's the, uh, the, the token. Let's read the definition again. That's the, um, uh, uh, the thing that confirmed or proved or authenticated that they were for God. So in that sense, the, the, miracles, the miracles were the seals. Just like Christ was sealed by God by the miracles that he did, just like Paul was sealed by God by the miracles that he did and performed and was able to impart uh, these gifts to other people, that's how they were sealed. So friends, don't think that, <clears throat> don't think that, uh, uh, that being sealed by the Spirit means once saved, always saved. Don't think that. Realize what the word means. Now, someone says, "Well, well, James, uh, how are we sealed today?" You mean to tell me we're not sealed today? Well, let's remember what the word means. It means confirmed, sealed, uh, or confirmed. If you believed a testimony, that was a seal. In John 3, verse 33, he said, He that receiveth his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. 
So if you believe what God revealed, if you believe in an, an, uh, an inspired man like Paul or Jesus, if you believe these individuals, then that was a seal or a testimony, a confirmation that you believe God is true. Now, in Romans 8, verses 16 to 17, the Bible says the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So here's the testimony. The Spirit testifies that we are God's children. Now, how does the Spirit testify? How does he confirm that we're God's children? <clears throat> how, what is his seal that he's given us? Friends, the seal I have of the Holy Spirit that I'm a child of God is the fact that I have obeyed the word that the Holy Spirit's given. Now, stay with me here. In Hebrews 10, verse 15. Hebrews 10, verse 15. The Bible says, there, Thereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, the Holy Spirit speaks, and he speaks to the Word of God, and that's his testimony. After that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So the Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. This is his seal. If you obey the gospel, the Spirit is testifying, that is, he's putting his confirmation <clears throat> that you are a child of God. It's not miraculous. It's not supernatural. But it is a confirmation because you can look at the Bible and say, this is what I did. Now, friends, I know this. If you're in a denomination, you did not do what the Bible says to be saved. Therefore, you're not sealed by the Spirit in that regard. The Spirit's not confirming you as a child of God. When you are arguing with what the Bible says you must do, in order to be saved. Just like my friend Jimmy that called in. When he wants to argue, well, the Bible, you know, water don't do anything for you. Well, the Spirit says it does. So there's no way the Holy Spirit is going to confirm someone in the Baptist church is going to be saved if they're saying that what the Spirit says you must do to be saved is not essential. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but <clears throat> if you fill out a form and you need it authenticated, and you decide, you know what, I'm not going to put my name on there, my full name. I'm not going to put my social security number. I'm not going to put my address on there. And I want the notary to notarize that I filled out this document correctly. If you didn't, in, if you didn't put uh, some of the required elements in that form, if you didn't put some of the required information in that form, the notary is not going to seal it as completed. They're not going to seal it. They're not going to say, yeah, this, this, is, this is a verified, this is a, uh, a, an authenticated form. It's not filled out. Now, friends, why would the Holy Spirit confirm, testify that you are a child of God when you didn't do what he said you must do in order to be a child of God? See that? That's how the Holy Spirit confirms. That's what he, that's what he does. So he's not going to set it to your seal. He's not going to testify that you're a child of God if you haven't done what he said. So, in the New Testament, yes, miracles were visible seals, signs, tokens, authentications that a person was speaking for God or doing the things that God wanted him to do, like an apostle being able to perform, perform miracles or lay hands on people and, and heal them, pass, pass on uh, miraculous gifts, and... Today, if you do what the Bible says, the Spirit's laying that to your seal. Friends, I'm running up against the clock. I've got a few minutes later left, so I want to give you some uh, contact information. And I want to say I appreciate the call, and I hope that <clears throat> my friend Jimmy will call back and uh, uh, tell everybody else to listen to. I hope, he, hope his preacher will call in. I don't think he will, but it would be nice to get a preacher on. Uh, but you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. 276-340-2653. Remember, friends, the Church of Christ is bringing you this program. Uh, we meet at 250 The Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. We meet at 9 a.m. for Bible study on Sunday morning, uh, 10 a.m. for worship, Thursday, Thursday night, 7 p.m. for Bible study, and it's 
you know, question and answer. You can ask questions. You can uh, have some dialogue. We'll be glad to study with you. We want to be your friend. We want to show you how much we care about you, and that's why we're doing this program. We never ask for money. We want you to know that we want to study with you and do all that we can to help you. And so if we can, please, please um, contact me, 276-340-2653, and that's a word from the Lord at gmail.com. I've got about 30 seconds left, so I want to say I appreciate you uh, listening. I appreciate the calls. Tell your friends and your family that we're on uh, the radio here on our Rockingham County Radio, and uh, Sundays at 5 p.m., and we hope to see you next week. So, again, this is James Oldfield with a word from the Lord, and um, we hope that you will come visit with us, and until next week, always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. Have a good evening.